Well, uh, welcome Salt Lake City. I am thrilled to be back at uh, B-Sides. I'm actually a local here in Utah, and I, I feel very fortunate. Uh, how, many, how many folks are not from Utah on here? All right, handful, cool. I know I've talked to some folks from Vegas, LA. I know Leslie coming out all the way from Chicago. So um, great to have you here. I am always thrilled and excited by our security community. I'm, uh, I'm always amazed at, at what's been built out here. I'm, uh, I feel privileged to, to be invited to, to be a part of that. And I'd say really the security community is, is kind of all of you sitting in those seats. So I just want to uh, thank you for, for doing such an amazing job for, for such a small area. We have an awesome community. So uh, awesome to be here. What I want to talk to you guys about is a little bit of credentials. And uh, we've got a problem. We have a credential problem, ladies and gentlemen. And I think you're all aware of that. I think we, uh, if you've been in the security community for any period of time, you are well aware that, that credentials are a vulnerability. However, I've got this sneaking suspicion that most people in our field actually don't know the extent of the problem. Right? It's incredibly complex, the, the Windows authentication system. And I think, frankly, it's almost too complex for someone that doesn't dedicate a lot of time uh, to fully understand. I mean, I'll give you an example. I, I've done, you know, over the last couple of years, probably 100 plus uh, interviews for folks uh, on the CrowdStrike team. And these are top tier security professionals. And I've walked away from almost every single one of those interviews largely with the, the sinking feeling that, my God, you know, this person really doesn't understand credentials. Uh, it's one of the, the common questions I ask because I think it's so important. And very rarely will anyone nail um, sometimes even the most simple questions. And that's a problem. And this is both red teamers and blue teamers. Amazing. Now, I expect kind of blue teamers sometimes. We kind of get, get our heads down, you know, kind of got our, our artifacts we look for. Uh, but I was especially surprised of red teamers uh, not truly understanding what they're constantly taking advantage of. They certainly know that they're stealing tickets or tokens, and they may be reusing those in order to move through the environment. Uh, but commonly, they don't know why the tickets or tokens are there. And that's going to be a big problem, because as we're going to see in this presentation, there's some good mitigations coming. Microsoft, the sleeping giant, has finally woken up, maybe, and started to, to try to fix some of these problems. Uh, and we're going to have some you know, pen testers, red teamers, and hopefully attackers, which are going to start stumbling. Right? Because what their old school techniques that work every time, all of a sudden are going to stop working. And with any luck, right? We can only hope. Uh, but. Uh, the idea of this presentation is really to kind of get us all up to speed on, on credentials. This is actually something I sat down, I, I was just so kind of down just um, with, with the level of kind of understanding of this, that I just sat down and kind of wrote what, what we're about to see. Actually, this is a part of a class that I co-author for SANS, the, the 508 Instant Response class. And you guys will be some of the first ones to, to get a look at it. And so I also wanted to get you the, the slides so you'd have kind of all the, uh, the bulk behind it. But we're going to talk about credentials. Now, think about the common attack cycle. You know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an instant responder uh, kind of by trade, so I'm more blue team. And so I'm constantly looking at what I call funnel points. I'm looking for areas where I can actually sift that big haystack and actually find where the attackers are, right? Hundreds of thousands of endpoints. Where do I know they're going to be? What do I know they're going to do that I can learn to track? And in my experience, or really in my opinion, probably credentials are the most critical part of any attack. I can't think of anything more important. No? And so let's kind of go through the cycle a little bit here. No? So an attacker first gains a foothold in the network. No? This is almost never going to be the place they want to end up. Right? Unless they get incredibly lucky, they're going to have goals that extend far beyond this first foothold, this first user workstation. No? So they're going to have to somehow get credentials where they can move around that environment. The great thing about Windows is that everything is tied to an account. Right. To, to give you an example, computers themselves have accounts. Right. Registry keys are tied to specific accounts. Right. Everything. Right. So if you don't have credentials, you're stuck. Right. So very commonly, if they're already admins, well, they're ready to rock, and they can kind of dump credentials. If they're not admin yet, they're going to have to do some sort of privilege escalation attack to get there. Because one of the, the key components of credentials in Windows is there's nothing native that can just allow you to get them. You're going to have to use some sort of attack technique, some sort of tool. 
And as we go through these slides, I'm going to try to point out kind of the common tools that we'll see attackers use. All right, so they're going to dump their first set of credentials. Now, similar to the, the, all the data they want not being on this box, it's very unlikely that all the credentials they want are going to be on this initial box. So they're going to take whatever they gather here, and with any luck, they're going to be able to move laterally through the environment. So they're going to start kind of expanding their influence throughout the environment. Now, everywhere they go, and this is very early in the attack cycle, they're going to, as you might have guessed, dump more credentials. You're going to see them over and over and over again dumping credentials as they move through the environment. I've seen attackers send out a scheduled task to 150 systems just to dump credentials from every system and bring them back. The goal, of course, is that one of those credentials is going to take them to the next level. And so they're going to continue to dump credentials until they achieve some sort of what I think Microsoft nicely calls domain dominance. This means total ownage, right? Once you get domain admin, now you have new unpaid admins in your environment, and you get to deal with all the fun that comes along with that. And so this, of course, is the, the primary goal of the attackers early in the attack cycle, and eventually they are going to get to a system where they're going to achieve those. It's almost inevitable. How many pen testers do I have in here? Don't be shy. I know we've got, you guys never want to self-identify. Right? Of my pen testers, when's the last time you did not get domain admin? Did anyone not get domain admin in their last attack? You? Scope, was that the problem? So you, you didn't do, <laughs> you weren't doing pen testing in a Windows environment. Yeah, yeah it's so funny. I was, uh, I was talking to someone who was actually a, uh, a, um, a computer network ex exploitation individual that actually was formerly at the um, Fort Meade NSA. And I was like, oh, okay, well, tell me how you typically do your attacks. So you, you tend to specialize on, in Unix systems. You know, what's your, what's your initial um, kind of entry point when you get there? Well, we first go to the Windows network, and we, uh, we gather credentials there. And inevitably, some of those credentials will be able to reuse in the Linux environment. It's like, it's like, that is not very exciting, right? That is not what I expected you to say, right? I wanted to hear some ninja techniques, you know, kind of attacking Linux. Yeah. So bottom line is they're eventually going to get their domain admin, and this is where they're finally going to achieve their goals. And in my experience, a dedicated attack group likely achieving domain admin 24 to 48 hours into the, into the attack. Right? But the good news is the techniques that they're using and what they're gathering are relatively finite set. Right? So these are things we can watch for, these are things we can detect. Right? And if we get lucky and detect it, we are very early in the attack cycle. We can stop it well before uh, they can accomplish their goals. All right, my pen testers. Has anyone ever written a 140 character pen test report? Anybody? 200 characters? If anybody raises their hand, I'm going to switch over. I'm, gonna, I'm moving to the red team. Right? But I will bet you your 50-page pen test report doesn't really say much more than this typically. Right? This is pretty much the way it always goes. Right? Get an initial foothold, spearfish attack, get access, dump credentials, move around, get domain admin, and get paid. Right? All right. Now, there is some hope on the horizon. I will tell you, when you think about the XP time frame, total security disaster, right? There are basically nothing stopping credential attacks uh, in that world. Um, when you get to Windows 7, <laughs> sort of, not much. Uh, we got user access control, which really just upset users more than anything, but um, not, uh, you know, user access control can frustrate some efforts uh, to gain credentials. You know, the whole idea of UAC was being able to have users run as admin, but not allowing kind of all their processes you know, to run as admin, even, even at that kind of level. So kind of restricting uh, kind of that least privilege or, or enforcing least privilege. Uh, the unfortunate thing, UAC is not a security boundary. And if you do some searching, you'll see there are plenty of UAC uh, kind of attacks that allow kind of easy in runs around it. Right? But at least causes attackers to work a little harder uh, to get that initial first uh, kind of admin rights to dump credentials. Right? Uh, about the only other good thing that came out of Windows 7 was something called managed service accounts. Now, uh, we'll come back to these, but uh, this was the idea of uh, recognizing the fact that service accounts are a huge liability in your environment. And managed service accounts will basically allow you to automatically uh, set very complex passwords on your service accounts and rotate those. Uh, right now, it's, uh, I think, every 30 days by default. Uh, and this is all managed through Active Directory. The initial implementation of it was totally kludgy and almost impossible to, to use at scale. Uh, there's a new version called grouped managed 
um, service accounts, which came out subsequently much better and much more realistic. Uh, so you'll see that's one of the things that I'm going to point out at the end as one of the most important things you can start thinking about. Now, between Windows 7 and Windows 8, we had a little thing called Mimi Cats. Who's heard of that? Yeah, thank you. I know that almost everyone in the room has heard about you know, some of the most evil uh, kind of malware we've seen in recent memory. And Mimi Cats uh, did something that kind of punched Microsoft in the face, basically. It did something that no one thought was even possible, which is start to pull out things like clear text passwords. Right? And so when Windows 8, really 8.1 rolled out, uh, Microsoft finally you know, kind of woke up and said, my God, we've got to do something about this. This is insane. Right? And so we get a lot of um, great mitigations that come out in the, in the 8.1 world, right? So that idea of now the removal of those, a lot of those clear text passwords uh, from memory, uh, assuming that they're not added back you know, through some stupid configuration that, <laughs> that an admin has done. Uh, we get uh, some uh, better account restrictions. There's a much easier way to restrict local accounts from being all, able to authenticate over the network. Uh, this is going to greatly uh, reduce the attack surface for things like pass the hash tickets, or sorry, pass the hash attacks. Uh, and so this is, a, this is a big win, a really easy thing to, to kind of get implemented. Uh, protected processes. Almost all of the credential dumping tools we'll deal with attack LSAS. You, know, you often inject into LSAS to get access to those credentials. So now we have an ability to set protected processes to greatly restrict who is access to something that frankly no one should have access to. We get into things like restricted admin. That's an idea of trying to reduce the attack service by not leaving your credentials everywhere that admin has actually interacted with your environment. You know, right now, the current state is basically shotgunning domain admin everywhere that, that admin's ever been. Right? And that's totally a fail. Right? So restricted admin starts us down that path of maybe reducing that attack surface. And then probably the most important thing we'll talk about in the entire deck, the domain protected users group. This is a huge win. So this is a new group uh, that comes out starting with Windows 8 um, that allows uh, you to now put your highly privileged accounts inside of it, and it greatly reduces uh, the, the capabilities of those accounts to leave their really sensitive tokens, uh, hashes, kind of around the environment. Now, so we're going to see we're going to see that kind of reference as we go through as a, a excellent kind of mitigation piece. It's a no-brainer to do. It'll it'll make your admin's job maybe a little more difficult. They're going to have to figure out. Some ways, for instance, delegate tokens, they won't be able to just single sign on uh, to third party systems. Um, but it is a huge win from uh, preventing attackers from getting access to those credentials. Yeah. Another good news is these were so popular that most of these have now been backported to Windows 7. So you really have no excuse to not implement some of these. Yeah. So you, you might be familiar with the pass the hash patch, um, which didn't really prevent pass the hash. Uh, but certainly added a bunch of these capabilities. That's now been backported back to your older systems. Then finally, in the new world we live in, Windows 10, I'm sure you're all implementing Windows 10 in your enterprise right now. Yeah. And when we get there, uh, we do get some additional uh, capabilities. Credential Guard here is probably the, the big win. Uh, this is a, uh, a truly kind of revolutionary piece. Finally, we get to a point where we may be able to prevent uh, the access to things like hashes and tickets. Uh, basically, what's happening is they're taking that LSAS process, moving into a protected hypervisor. So all of your kind of credentials now are, are in a very protected space, like an enclave, uh, with very, very few functions that can access them. Uh, I'm not saying this will never be compromised, but certainly it breaks all current uh, set of tools out there. Uh, the only problem is you need certain hardware and certain software uh, to get it up and running. Uh, but this is something that's going to be a potential big win, finally, for us to finally stop attackers from getting those, uh, those easy wins. Uh, remote Credential Guard is an update to restricted admin. Um, that's a better implementation, not just admin, but any account. Again, protecting um, any accounts that are uh, authenticating over the network, right, through things like RDP. And then finally, Device Guard is, is basically an upgrade to AppLocker, a uh, whitelisting capability that will prevent certain binaries from running. So this uh, implemented correctly, uh, could uh, basically break again all of our known attack tools because essentially you're doing application whitelisting. So hope on the horizon. Um, as we're going to see, we're severely outmatched. Right? These mitigations are not going to be the silver bullet for us. Uh, but what I'm going to do is reference these as we go through uh, with the thought of trying to um, talk about how we can at least make our attackers' lives more difficult. Okay, so who's been in security more than 10 years? Eh, a few hands. All right, of those that had your hands up, who remembers talking about hashes over 10 years ago? Huh? 
This is the gimme, right? We've been talking about hashes forever, right? We started with landman hashes. Those have been largely deprecated, although there's probably environments that you guys are working in where they may still be present. Now we're at the NT hash. We've known the NT hashes are incredibly insecure for, I don't know, a good decade or longer, right? No salt, uh, totally uh, vulnerable to things like pre-computation attacks and rainbow tables. Um, these are one of the first things that attackers will try to dump when they get on a system, right? It's been this way for probably 15 plus years, maybe two decades, uh, attackers have been going after our hashes. Yeah. Now, the old school techniques when, you know, when you old timers were getting your initial training was to dump the hashes and do what? Crack them, right? So you dump them, crack them. We still did that a day because it's fun. We feel like hackers. But I'm telling you, we don't even have to do that anymore. Right? So hopefully you've heard of things like pass the hash where you don't even need to crack the hash anymore. Your nice 25-character password so long and complex it makes your fingers bleed when you type it in. It doesn't matter, because if you have the hash, we can simply replay it through the environment and authenticate with just the hash. Yeah. This is one of the biggest vulnerabilities that's come out. And as you can see, tons of tools down here that allow us access to these hashes. Uh, the, you know, kind of the, the rogues gallery here. Now, one of the interesting things I've seen in the wild is that while we get a lot of custom malware, you know, we're all dealing with nation states now or, or highly resourced criminal syndicates uh, with obvious capabilities to develop their own malware. One of the most interesting things is that the, the one tool that most attack groups are not implementing are the credential dumping tools. These work so well, there's just no incentive for them to go build their own. You know? And so it's, you know, you look at any attack, I think every attack I've seen in the last five years has probably had Mimi Cats involved in it, right? You just got to learn to look for, for that type of attack, and you're well along your way. All right, so we get our hashes. Right? Now, one thing I think the security community has, has absolutely woken up to is uh, this idea of, of where our hashes are being stored. I think finally we're realizing this is an important concept. Right? So, you know, just as a quick review, any interactive logon, your credentials are going to be in play. Right? Interactive logons, meeting at the console, RDP, you do a run as. Right? When you do those and you're authenticated to that remote system, your credentials are now present on that remote system for the length of your session. Right? If an attacker happens to stumble upon that box, they can easily dump their credentials and now they're off to using your credentials for evil. Right? So what we have to do is we have to take the knowledge as a security community and we have to filter that down to the admins where it really matters. I think most of us are probably good with this, but I know that most admins are not. Most admins have no idea that when they RDP to a system with their domain admin creds, that their domain admin creds are now going to be present on that remote system. Right? Even worse than that, they make stupid mistakes. You know, so when you RDP, you can either close your RDP session, right? so you can actually log off, or you can do what? Just X out and close the client, right? When you X out and close that client, your session is still present on that remote system. You might have run into this. Sometimes you'll run into a box like your own. You'll go into work in the morning and you'll go to log in and it'll say, do you want me to log out the admin? It's because they were in your system overnight maybe patching it and they just closed their RDP client. They didn't actually log out of your box. Their, their credentials are still present on that system. Right? We've got to retrain. Well, we've got to retrain our admins and we've got to take the keys of the kingdom out of their hands until they can actually use it effectively. Right? So lots of different ways, probably the, the most effective way on this, uh, on this chart, PowerShell. When you get to PowerShell remoting, all of a sudden, it's no matter what you're doing, even if you open up a remote terminal using PowerShell, that's still a non-interactive logon. It's about the best case scenario. You're using the best of Windows authentication and you're not sending your credentials all over the place. So we've got to train our admins uh, to, to do this more reasonably. All right, so how does this work? G GSEC dump, a very, very common tool. So I often see this um, actually in this example. This is a, a very common uh, place we'll see it, which this example was done on a domain controller. All right, so what we're seeing here is at the top, um, we're elevating our privileges from admin up to the system account. So a lot of these tools require actually system level privileges to actually do the injection um, kind of into LSAS to actually pull the credentials out. And then we're simply just running the tool GSEC dump and dumping the output to a text file. The contents of the text file look like this. This won't surprise anyone. We get a huge collection of hashes. But remember what I just said? I just said that I should only be seeing the hashes on the system of the current logged in sessions. This is actually something that wasn't always the case. I think XP Service Pack 2 started to enforce that where they try to clean up the sessions uh, when you close them out. 
But we're seeing hundreds in this, in this example. There were hundreds of hashes available on this box. And the reason is because of what I just mentioned. This actually happened to be a domain controller. So the domain controller is leveraging hundreds of, of current, concurrent kind of logon sessions through that environment. And this is why you'll see a lot of attackers taking the very risky move of dropping to your domain controller and running you know, pretty uh, evil malware on it. You know, if you're a good attacker, stay away from the domain controller, right? This is the one place that admins will actually kind of look at and monitor. But sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. And so a common technique you'll see is dropping over to the domain controller, running a tool like GSEC dump. Now I've got, you know, 100 plus uh, hashes on there. The odds of one of those being a, a highly privileged user, very high. Right? So once I get these hashes, well, now I can go to a tool like Mimikatz or Metasploit or your tool of choice and do what we call a pass the hash attack. All I'm doing is essentially feeding one of those hashes I just retrieved to my tool. And as that tool authenticates, now I'm actually authenticating as that user. In this case, uh, we yanked the help desk account. So now I've got the hash and I'm able to start to traverse or laterally move the network as that help desk account. Literally one line. Uh, using Mimikatz, and now I'm that person. So this is a classic example of what we call a pass the hash attack. Take the hash, replay it through the environment to accomplish my goals. Anybody seen this in real life? Anybody done this? I hope. We've got some pen testers. We almost certainly have done pass the hash. All right. How do we protect about the, against this? It's simple. This is all you have to do, seriously. So go back and just stop attackers from getting admin rights. And when you figure out how to do that, please email me and tell me how you did it. <laughs> it's basically impossible right now. Sad. It's so sad. But um, this is just something we have proven as a, as a community. We're just, it's virtually impossible at this point. Right? But if we could, all of these attacks I'll talk about for the rest of this deck actually require admin rights. So if we ever got to this magic land where we could enforce privileges, well, we'd be, uh, we'd be well off to a, to a head start on the attackers. But assuming that that's not possible, there are other things we can do. Certainly stop spraying your most important accounts through the environment. Get your admins to stop RDPing with their domain admin creds, right? Um, teach them about how to properly terminate those sessions. Think about if you're in a Windows 10 or 8 world, employing something like restricted admin um, or remote credential guard, which that means even if they RDP with their domain admin creds, those won't be present on those remote systems. They're protected now uh, with these new uh, mitigations. Uh, obviously, when we get to Windows 10, we can start to prevent the ability to get the credentials themselves. If you have credential guard running on a system, no current attack tool can actually dump the hashes. So you don't have to worry about them passing them because they can't get them. Uh, and obviously things like that, the domain protected users group. That's again going to be probably the most important takeaway of the entire uh, talk today, which is if you can get your most important accounts in that, those also aren't providing those hashes uh, around your network that can easily be stolen. All right, hashes. I think hashes are the gimme here. Uh, tokens is where I see a lot of people falling down on. Uh, this is a, just a surprisingly complicated uh, authentication mechanism in Windows. Uh, and so the idea of a token is that when you log into a session, a token is created. The token has your, your security identifier, it has all the groups you belong to, it has all of your privileges. Right? Now this token is reused all over the place. Every process that you spawn in your session actually gets a copy of your token. Right? This is how these processes know kind of what your levels of privileges are. Right? You'll have things like a, if you attach to like a file share or something like that. Very commonly, that process attaching will need to do something that we call impersonate your token. They'll need to load your token up into their process space in order to basically restrict or keep, uh, keep all of your privileges uh, in place to make sure that you can't exceed those rights and privileges that you have. Uh, so this idea of impersonation is used all over the place in Windows. Basically something else taking your token and reusing it as you. Now, as you can imagine, if a standard Windows process or service can do this, so can an attack tool. And what our attackers do is when they get those admin rights, they get on the box, they can basically look at all the open tokens in the environment or on the system that they're currently on, grab one, and start reusing it. They can basically impersonate you. Right? So very commonly, this is used for privilege escalation. 
right? You're admin currently, you want to be domain admin. If I can find a machine that a domain admin is on or didn't properly terminate a session on, I can steal their token and I automatically become domain admin. Right? It's maybe the simplest way to achieve domain admin rights, kind of in the wild. Uh, this also allows us to do things that maybe hashes um, don't allow us to do. Let's say I want to create like a user account. Right? I can't really do that through a pass the hash account uh, or pass the hash attack. Uh, but having like a token uh, impersonation, I can. And probably even worse, and, and by far the, the most biggest liability of tokens, is that certain impersonation tokens can be what we call delegate tokens. Delegate tokens are essentially single sign-on. They allow you to authenticate to remote resources using your token. Yeah. So if you have a domain admin token that's a delegate token, basically now you can move around the environment using that account. Right. So it's a huge problem. You see we've got some pretty classic tools uh, that allow us to do this. And this is what it looks like. Right? So Mimikatz has a one-line command, right? So we're currently sitting here as a T as the T Dungan user, right? I run the very simple command within Mimikatz, elevate domain admin. What it does is search through all of the tokens on the current system. If it finds a domain admin uh, level token, it will immediately grab it and load that into memory for me so I can start to interact as that user. Right? And you'll notice in this case, look at the impersonation down at the bottom. In this case, we found a domain admin token that had the delegation uh, capability, so now we can immediately start laterally moving uh, using this. I've now essentially owned the environment. So an extremely common way to, uh, to achieve that next level or that next rung up um, on the credential scale. You know, how many, how many of my pen testers have actually stolen a token in the last year? Anybody? You have? Scary? Yeah? So I know we probably have, you know, almost every pen tester in here has probably done token stealing the last year. How many of, of the blue teamers, who I assume the rest of you are, have actually found token stealing in your environment? It's really hard. It leaves very, very few uh, clues. Uh, you'll see some event logs, some, you know, essentially some come authentication events start to show up. But actually identifying the fact that a token was stolen, unless you have really, really good auditing, um, you're basically blind. Right? So again, our best case scenario is going to be to essentially stop these tokens from being available. Right? So yes, if we could have prevent admin, we'd be all right. Assuming that's not, first case is stop the madness. Right? Stop these interactive sessions from being uh, kind of the, using highly um, privileged accounts. We just can't do that anymore. Right? Uh, so again, something like Remote Credential Guard, when you have that in place, it actually does not push your token to that remote system. Um, uh, simple way, so even if you can't get to some of the new hotness, like Remote Credential Guard in Windows 10 or Protected Users Group, you can easily go to Active Directory and for your most important accounts, just mark them to not delegate. Right? That essentially kill, that, well, it doesn't kill it, it still allows um, on the system um, impersonation, which you can still get um, kind of the next rung up from a privilege escalation, but it prevents you from being able to use that token now remotely, which is what most attackers want. Right? So that's a big win. And then certainly if you can get to protected users group, so if you can employ that in your environment, um, that by default does not push tokens. Actually, all tokens in that group are non-delegate. By definition, you can't change it. Right? So you automatically get like this wonderful kind of group of, of pr protections around the accounts in that group. All right, so hashes, tokens, right? Let's say that you do everything right, right? You are on the ball, you've already implemented credential guard in your environment, right? You are high-fiving your team, right? You get to actually have a weekend for a change, right? So the attackers get on the box, they can't dump tokens, they cannot dump hashes, you, you've locked everything down, there's no delegate tokens, you've got your hashes in, in your protected enclave of credential guard, and sadly, all attackers have to do is go and dump something called cash credentials. And they're off to the races again. Now, this is another super old school kind of authentication mechanism. Right? How many have heard of this? Probably a lot more than tokens, right? This is something we've known about forever. Uh, the idea is that in a domain environment, usually your accounts authenticate to the domain controller. The only problem is, what if you've got all your nice laptops in front of you and you're not currently connected to your domain controller? How do you actually log on with your domain account? Well, to do that, the account credentials have to be stored someplace outside of the domain controller. Where this is stored is actually something called cached credentials. Basically allows you to use a domain account offline. 
By default, 10 of these are stored. Some brilliant um, individual at Microsoft decided with the, the 2008 server release to upgrade this to the last 25 credentials being cached. Right? Now, I want you to think about this. Right? First of all, how often should a server not be connected to the domain? Yeah, that's pretty darn rare, right? Um, also, on your laptops, do we have a lot of shared computers anymore? Right? How many people have actually logged onto your laptop in the last year right, that you know of? Probably you and you and you and maybe the help desk, right? Why do we need to cache 10 credentials? That's often an historical record of everyone who's ever logged onto that box, including the domain admin who set it up for you three years ago. Hopefully they've changed their password since then, but if they haven't, their credentials are still archived on every machine that they've been to. Uh, so cache credentials are, um, are a huge liability. Uh, the good news is they are not in the same format as your traditional NTLM hashes. So they are salted, so uh, rainbow tables don't work against these. Um, this is one of the few places where actually having a really good password policy can actually help you because the only attack against these is they have to be cracked. Right? They can't be replayed like an NTLM hash. So that's the only kind of saving grace here. Right? But check this out. So um, one of the uh, trends that we've seen recently is moving away from dumping credentials on a standard box. So dropping your GSEC dump or your Mimikatz tool or whatever that is. Because obviously we're starting to look for that and we have security tools that know what all of those tools look like and we're catching that. Right? So a common uh, mitigation to that from the attack side is basically to come and just dump your LSAS process, or in this case, dump your registry hives, and take them for an offline attack. Right? That way I don't have to run my nasty tool on your box, I just have to figure out some way to get your salmon security hive, and I can do everything offline without triggering your intrusion protection system, whatever that is. So this is a pretty cool little project just written in Python, and so as you notice at the top, uh, we did a PW dump from the SAM hive. Now, those are just going to be the local accounts, right? Those won't be a domain account. They'll just be what's stored in your SAM, which are local accounts. You notice there's not many, right? Same thing, same project, did the cache dump tool, and now running it against your security hive, and look at everything else that pops up. These are what you really want. These are your domain accounts. And actually, in this environment, one of those was actually the domain admin. Right? And so now we've got the domain admin's crashed, cached credentials. All I have to do is go back to my cracking rig, crack this uh, using MS Cache 2 and John the Ripper, if you're curious, and with any luck, they'll have a weak enough password that I'll have domain admin tomorrow. All right, how do we prevent cached credentials? Well, a lot of you will see guidance like turn your cached credentials to zero. Um, sometimes a good idea. Um, NSA has had some guidance to tell people to do that. A lot of your DOD guidance comes out to four or less. Um, depending on if the system's mobile or not, you can tweak that. Uh, just be careful, zero is not always the right answer. Uh, the reason why is that um, it's not always just your personal account that's being cached. Things like that computer account sometimes get cached here. And so if you drop it to like only one cached credential, well, you might edge, edge out the actual user's credential. Or even things like smart cards. Sometimes a smart card authentication is actually two different um, authentications. Or so two different things get cached, and that can over override or, or kind of age out the actual person's credentials that need to be cached. Right? So you could have a lot of bricked systems if you turn this down too low. Um, by far, probably the best option, just have a good password complexity. You know, usually I, I laugh at the complexity rules because you have things like pass the hash where they're totally useless. This is one of the few areas left where it still matters. Yeah. And then, of course, if you have something in the protected users group, by definition, those accounts don't cache credentials on remote boxes. So another big win. Seeing the trend here? Get some users into that group. All right, so cached credentials, super old school, something maybe even older than that. Um, LSA secrets. Yeah. I will tell you, this is very old school, um, but I've seen more red teams get big wins from this than almost anything else. Uh, when we talk about LSA secrets, we're not talking about user accounts now. We're actually talking more about service accounts. And so what happens, you have things like services. Remember, a service has to run without user interaction. Right? So if you set up a service to use like a domain account, well, that domain account has to somehow authenticate. And the way it authenticates without interaction is it has to store the credentials locally. Right? And so what happens is, let's say you have your backup software. And your backup software requires 
um, a service being run across your environment as some sort of highly privileged domain account, right? So they can access all the boxes to back them up. Right? Well, that's awesome, but what you just did is you just shotgun that entire highly privileged account into the LSA secrets of every machine that that uh, service runs on. Right? And wonderfully, once you can get access to the machine, you can dump it out in plain text. The particular dangers here of service accounts is they are rarely changed, right? So you have probably have service accounts in your environment that haven't been changed in three or four years. People are scared to change them because you don't know what it will break, right? Some admin three, you know, three generations ago set something up, it's still running, so just keep it as is. These are often also very highly privileged accounts. Right? And so this is kind of the, um, just the, the syndrome and the, the kind of worst case scenario coming to light with these service accounts. So very, very simple. These are stored directly in the registry with admin rights. You can do something like this, dump out all the LSA secrets. In this case, this is a big win. This is the, the SQL server. Uh, we pull out a relatively strong password to that SQL server account, and now we can start to authenticate on that around the network. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I've actually seen environments where people have been told to run their SQL server using domain admin rights. And if that's the case, you just own the network uh, with one command. Another thing you'll notice on this, this is actually PowerShell. It's another trend we've seen, is a, uh, many, uh, many tools are now being rewritten to, to work in the PowerShell environment. You might be familiar with PowerSploit. Uh, this is a, a, a lesser known framework called Nisheng, uh, which is also a pen testing slash offensive uh, Power, PowerShell exploit kit. Does an awesome job of pulling LSA secrets out. All right, so how do we protect about this? Um, well, this is where your big takeaway, you're probably the second most important takeaway of today, go audit your service accounts, right? These things are such a liability uh, in your environment, right? If you do one thing this year, go back, identify all the service accounts, identify which ones are running as domain accounts, those are by far the most vulnerable, uh, figure out if you need them, figure out if you've changed the password recently, and if you've done all of that, start to audit those service accounts. Right? This is a wonderful place when you're hunting through your environment. Identify malicious service account usage can be very easy because typically service accounts do the same thing. That backup service probably authenticates type 3 logons throughout your environment, say your server environment, right? If you start seeing that account authenticating with a type 10, like an RDP type authentication, that's a God-given clue <laughs> that you are owned, right? Go, find that and kill it, right? And so um, you've got, we've got to wrap our head around these service accounts. If anything, just doing this will prepare you for when you do get that intrusion. Because almost inevitably, you're going to end up doing a full password reset of your environment at some point in your career. If you've already gone out and identified where all your service accounts are, God, you're 50% of the way there. You know, the, the, the level of hardship that it puts teams on to identify these is just astonishing. So get ahead of the game would be my recommendation. And of course, if you can, Microsoft does have a solution for this called those group managed service accounts. And this will provide really strong passwords and roll them over every 30 days by default. All right, so you guys are probably thinking, Chad, I know about all that, right? Tell me something that I don't know, right? This is, <laughs> you're boring me. Right, this is all old school. We've been doing this for 10 years. And you're right. Although I will say in 99% of your environments, this stuff still works. It's ridiculous. Right? But this is what was supposed to fix it for us, right? Kerberos, right? Remember that Kerberos comes out of MIT. This was going to provide some sanity to our authentication mess in Windows, you know, way back in NT days. Right? Now, unfortunately, uh, as an idea, in theory, Kerberos is pretty darn secure, right? It has wonderful things like the ability to prevent replay attacks, right? You know, there's a timing mechanism in Kerberos. Uh, but what you'll notice in the implementation in real life is that it's been um, just largely riddled with holes in order to make it work effectively. You know, as an example, uh, yes, you can actually prevent replay attacks in Kerberos, but what happens is that everything in your environment is tied to an account, so it inundates the domain controller with all these requests for accessing you know, every single object in the environment, and simply you can't do that. The you just performance goes kind of nosedives. Right? So what happens, as you see here, you often have tickets that are valid for 10 hours. Right? So I get a ticket, I can reuse that ticket for 10 hours, which shouldn't be possible in the kind of the Kerberos spec. Right? There's all these kind of um, you know, vulnerabilities that have kind of been introduced there. Right? So I would say that while this is probably the most advanced piece of Windows authentication, 
it has the biggest vulnerabilities. It's the typical kind of the more complex it is, the more holes are in place. And, and traditionally, like the last couple of years, Kerberos has just been under fire, right? We've just seen howitzers being aimed at Kerberos and blowing giant holes into it. Right? Here's the simplest. So just like past the hash, well, if I can get access to a ticket, which is kind of the, the core unit of Kerberos, I can just pass that ticket in the same exact way we saw uh, past the hash. Right? So all I have to do is, in this case, uh, we're running as a standard user to Dungan here. All I have to do now is just dump a ticket from anywhere, import it into this computer, and in this case, this was the domain admin ticket, and now I'm that domain admin. Right? So I can just take a, a ticket and move it around the environment, import it, and it's off to the races. And you can see now I'm authenticated as that, um, in this case, domain admin. All right, so that's the Mimikatz tool. Um, it's way, way more complicated than pass the ticket. So pass the ticket is like level one. Uh, you get into things called like overpass the hash. Um, this one's clever. So if you start to run into issues where maybe pass the hash isn't working, you could actually go and just take the hash, supply the hash to the domain controller, and get a ticket back. And now you've got a ticket that you can then use to do things like pass the ticket. Right? We call this overpass the hash. Um, a relatively new technique that's come out uh, called Kerber roasting. Uh, this one, you know, literally I had to sit down and almost came to tears when I saw it. Um, amazingly, the way the whole Kerberos environment is set up is that any user account can request a ticket or service ticket for any service in the environment. The domain controller doesn't know whether you have privileges to a certain computer or a certain service. Right? It says, yeah, here's the ticket, provide this to that remote resource, and it will authenticate whether you have access or not. The only problem is that ticket is encrypted with the NT hash of that service. Right? So basically, I can request every service, every account in the environment, get all of their NT hashes back nicely, Kerberos provides them to me, take them offline, find one that's a domain account with high-level high privileges, crack it offline, and I'm back in the game. Right? Ridiculous, right? but extremely possible, very hard to detect. Who's heard of a golden ticket? The Willy Wonka golden ticket. I'm glad to see so many hands go up. Uh, this was another kind of aha moment uh, that, again, came out via the Mimikatz tool. Uh, this is an ability to create a ticket that can literally work indefinitely. Um, to any account, you can make yourself magically domain admin. You can make an account that doesn't even exist in the environment domain admin and authenticate. You know, the crazy thing here, this, the, this is the worst case scenario. You successfully remediate your environment. You do a full password reset of every account in the environment. Right? Your attackers go away. They come back the next month. They get their initial foothold again through another spear phishing attack. Once they have local access, they can re-import that old golden ticket in and they immediately become domain admin. Right? They again own the entire domain. There's only one way to prevent this. You've got to change that KRPGT password, and twice, actually, at the domain controller. If you forget to do that, golden tickets last indefinitely. Silver tickets are kind of uh, the not, they, at first they don't seem as hot or as, as useful, but these things can be incredibly useful. This is similar to the golden ticket, but it only is valid for a single resource. Right, like a single computer or a single service. Uh, what's really valuable about these is that they don't authenticate against the domain controller. So you get no logging with the domain controller when these are used. Right? So they become a very stealthy way uh, to move through the environment. And just to punch Microsoft in the nose one more time, we got the skeleton key that came out a while ago, which essentially, once you have access to the domain controller, you can go patch LSAS in the domain controller and essentially create a back door into any account you want where your password always works, right? So it basically is a very, very easy backdoor with essentially zero logging uh, uh, part of it, right? Unless you're logging you know, driver usage on that system, which is pretty rare. All right, so um, the, and, th and this is growing, right? We're gonna see probably three or four more attacks in the next year or two, um, kind of on Kerberos. The latest hotness, which isn't on here, uh, things like uh, DC syncing. You can set up a fake DC, or pretend like you're a DC and get the entire DC to sync its, all of its accounts to you effortlessly. Right. So how do we prevent about this? I know. <laughs> Is anybody depressed yet? I'm kind of depressed. <laughs> how, do we, how do we prevent this? Well, um, credential guard for past the ticket. So it's certainly that will protect all your tickets. You can't just dump tickets from a local system anymore. Uh, remote credential guard will prevent your credentials from being kind of placed um, all in all those remote systems that your users are authenticating to. 
Uh, Kerberos or Kerber roasting is completely uh, reliant upon cracking of those hashes. So if you can have very complex passwords on your service accounts, which is basically what Kerber roasting is attacking, um, then you will essentially prevent that attack. Um, you know your service attack accounts are, are valuable and interesting, so set up really good monitoring around those. And then finally, um, some of the guidance um, that um, I've been giving to people is basically change, regardless of what happens, change that KRBG T, KRB TGD ticket at least once a year. That way you at least are expiring golden tickets that may be out in the wild on your environment at least once per year. Now that's scary in itself. Some, some admins don't want to touch that because they're afraid they'll, it'll break the entire domain. You might as well do it now because you're probably going to have to do it later anyway. Right? So get the pain while you, while you can plan for it and then um, get it into your regular rotation. All right, and if it wasn't bad enough, right? <laughs> I see like hands on heads. It's like seriously. Um, the nuclear option, of course, is why do I need a single hash or why am I just dumping hashes all over? Once I've got domain admin privileges, I can just go straight to the domain controller and I can just download the entire Active Directory. Right? And so this is a very, very common technique that you'll see uh, in modern attacks. The attackers will just go to the domain controller, find some way, often through vol volume shadow copies, get a um, backdoor into that locked account, which is called the nts.dit, and that is all your password hashes. Not just all the password hashes that are current, it also has the history of all the hashes of that account. You have things like, you know, kind of a history of how many times someone has changed their password, so they can't reuse the same password when you force them to change it every 90 days. You can get all their previous hashes as well, which can sometimes be valuable because you can predict things like password reuse through that. So basically, we can just yank that file, take it offline, and your entire Active Directory is, is now the attackers. Right. So extremely common. Uh, this is a great example. This is actually pulling it out. Uh, this was, they were, these were um, commands pulled out of memory. And so we see the attackers essentially going using VSS admin to list the shadow copies. They must have found a shadow copy because they just copy out the three files they need in order to extract those hashes, pull them offline, and if you look back one, you get a tool like NTDS Extract, nice free tool online, which will yank all those hashes out and allow you to start cracking them, pass the hash attacks, overpass the hash attacks. You know, as you can imagine, you're pretty much good to go at this point. You ever wonder why attackers continue to do things like this even after they've they've achieved domain dominance? Right? Why, do, why do they keep dumping credentials, right? Once you've got 20 good credentials that work, why do I need to actually go get everything? It's just because they pack rats? Yeah. Password reuse, or um, often what I've seen is you, you do a full password reset in the environment. Do you ever do a full password reset? That's so hard to do, right? Commonly, you're going to miss a account or two They've got all of them. So when they come back, they just start rolling through all the admin accounts. You might have an old admin account you haven't touched in three years, right? If you haven't changed that password, they're back in the next day. Right? This is almost like a get out of jail free card. This is their, you know, kind of their big dumpster dive of all your data. Right? So knowing this and knowing they're coming, right? Do we have any soccer players in here? Right? You have this giant soccer field, right? Where are the attackers going? Help me. To your goal, right? Goal, right? You know where they're going. They're going to your domain controller. If you do anything, watch that. It's just like the soccer goal. We know they're coming at some point. Now, there's a million different ways they can come at you, you know, using PowerShell or any variety, PS exec or any variety of other tools. But we know they're coming. So this is a great place to, to kind of put some effort towards uh, some detection mechanisms. All right. This one's simple. <laughs> Bottom line is, how do you protect this? You know, don't, um, don't give them domain admin creds. Again, that's hard. Uh, the other way is detection. You know, the way that you create those things like the skeleton key, or dumping ntds.dit, or going and creating a golden ticket. You've got to get the domain controller to get those credentials to, to make all that happen. So let's sit and watch uh, and look for unusual activities. All right, I could sit here for a, literally another three hours and we could keep d digging into this. This is um, only the start of the credential problem in Windows. Um, there are so many more issues. You know, we haven't talked about things like the Windows Vault, uh, things like smart card pins, uh, the um, Microsoft Cloud accounts, which is a total disaster. Um, the Microsoft uh, Hello 
that's coming out on all the newer systems, right? Uh, if, if history has taught us anything, uh, we are seeing an escalated amount of attacks against credentials, right? So we're going to be surprised at what attackers are coming up with in the next couple of years. Right? So you've got to stay on top of this, right? There's a great chart put out by Benjamin Delpy, who uh, is the author of Mimi Cats. He continues to, um, to surprise us uh, with new attacks against credentials. If you're not watching him, you absolutely should be. All right. So we are in a red state, so I know that we're all happy that um, we, we have the Commander-in-Chief up here to, uh, to encourage us along. I will tell you, your mission is to go back and do something about this, right? If you are a blue teamer, go back and start to audit those service accounts. Start to look at your highly privileged accounts. Can you move some of those into things like that uh, domain protected users group, right? Can you actually um, start to think about things like remote credential guard, preventing kind of your uh, credentials from being shotgunned around the environment? Can you retrain your admins? Can you do simple things like simply turn off delegation for tokens of your highly privileged accounts, right? Every little bit counts, right? And for those red teamers out there, you've got to up your game, right? It's been really easy, right, up till now. But I will tell you, with some of these new mitigations in place, I've seen attackers currently um, that are trying to pass the hash in environments and failing, and they can't figure out why. We're sitting there watching them on the wire, and it's failing, failing. And they're not realizing that now in the Windows 7 and above environment, local accounts don't have the ability to pass the hash, right, if the environment's set up correctly. So their attacks are totally for naught, but they're leaving behind clues that we can track anyway. Right? So as red team is, you're going to have to up your game because you're going to start running into some, um, some brick walls. Right? All right, so um, if you're not familiar with SANS, this is part of the 508 um, Advanced Forensics and Incident Response class. Um, you guys have some, uh, hopefully some great notes that will help you kind of with that charge uh, from the Commander-in-Chief. Um, and if you want any more information, my contact information's uh, kind of on this deck, or feel free to, to hit me up uh, during the rest of the conference. I've got a few minutes for questions. Wow, you were, you were waiting. Does multi-factor help on any of this? Um, the answer is not much. Right, so we got these, you know, you talk about like the DOD environment where you have kind of the smart cards. It turns out the smart cards, once you authenticate with that smart card, you have many of the same pieces, the tickets, the tokens are still all in play. And once the authentication occurs, those can still be stolen and moved around irregardless of, um, of that kind of um, smart card. So in general, sadly, multi-factor is, um, is not a great mitigation at this time. Um, Josh. So are there any attacks that you don't need admin level privileges to, to accomplish um, that we talked about today? Uh, man, I, not, that I, not that I can think of. Almost everything, so even some of the offline attacks that you saw, like things like grabbing the system SAM hive, you gotta have admin to get access to those. Um, if you could get, well, if you can get access to the raw disk, but so you need admin rights to get access to the raw disk, so you pretty much have to have admin rights, in my, at least in my knowledge, for all these attacks to work. Now, as you probably know, that's not a very high hurdle, right? There are so many privilege escalation attacks that once you get your user account, getting to admin is just not that difficult in the majority of environments. Um, but if we could stop it, if you can make your environment more hostile, you stop you know, almost all of the attacks that maybe everything I talked about today, um, outside of maybe Kerber roasting. Kerber roasting is an example where you don't need admin because you just request any ticket and it just comes out. Right? So there's probably a few in there that maybe don't, but for the most part, you need admin. Yes, sir. Yeah, they're like timestamps that can be added to the hash to prevent things like past the hash. Uh, there are actually a fair amount of timestamps used. Uh, for instance, Kerberos is very timestamp dependent. It's just as we saw, it didn't work well at scale. So they, they had to like let these things kind of persist for, for long periods of time. Um, so now I don't see timing um, really working. At least um, I can't envision what the next authentication is going to be. 
Um, but they've, they've effectively prevented a lot of past the hash. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I just don't, uh, I don't see that as being a big, a big mitigation. All right. Well, thank you all very much. It's so awesome to be here. Um, I hope you have a great rest of the conference.